Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. The hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered. Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, and fail again. Oh, everything I believe in, now I surrender. I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to say. He is mighty. Uh, no, we're going to be continuing on, though, in the series that Pastor Larry has started. Um, we're going to be continuing our journey through 1 Peter. So if you have your Bibles and you want to open up to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 22 through 25. And it's just going to be a, a great time of looking at what God's Word is, is empowering us to do as believers in Him. And so I hope that you are able to follow along. I'll have the verses up here uh, in just a moment as well. We'll go through it together. Um, but I'm just going to ask that we just uh, unite together in a word of prayer. Let's bless uh, this time digging into God's word. And friends, I don't know what you are battling with individually, but just invite that spirit to move in you today. And I guarantee you God is going to do something good, okay? So let's go ahead and pray together. Father God, we just thank you for this time to gather, to look into your word today. I just pray that you would use me as a vessel, as an instrument, to allow your people to hear the words you want them to hear. God, it is in your name that we gather and that we pray these things, and amen. You know, in our world today, we tend to, Satan has, has created this environment where any words that somewhat mean something in the, in the Christian world, he, he likes to twist them, and he, he tries to get us to use these words all the time just so that they lose their, what we in the Christian world, their real meaning, Right? And so it's really easy. One of these words, ready? I'm going to say it to you. The word love, yes, right? Love in its, in its real intent is talking about, like, for God so loved the, the world, right? Are you with me? That he gave his only son. All right, but here's the thing. So now in our society, we will say, oh, I love McDonald's chicken nuggets. Oh, I, I, love, uh, I love that hat, Bo. It's just fantastic. It just finishes the outfit. Right? We use this word and we try to use it so regularly that then when we hear this message that, hey, guess what? God loves you. And he loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. Sometimes that message then isn't as powerful as it could be. Because people have this watered down aspect of what love means. You know, another word that we it's starting to creep up more and more. And for many years, I recall, even when I was growing up, anytime that I would hear the thought of being born again, 
I knew, and maybe it's because I have a, a background in the church, but I knew what being born again represented, you know? But now you hear these things uh, like for, uh, for athletics. In athletics, you know, uh, somebody could be down in a series. Uh, baseball is, is, is coming to the close finally for the season, right? And so you have this now terminology where if somebody is down three games to one or three games to nothing, and then they win a game, they're like, ooh, a new birth. They've been born again in this playoff run. I've heard that recently. But when I say born again, I'm not talking about something of this world that's just going to wither away and die, right? I'm talking about a rebirth, a new birth in Jesus Christ and through Christ to be born again into the Spirit of God. So it's important that we realize that we, we look at these terms and, and as you hear the meaning, be cautious on how you use them. When you're saying the word love, really mean it that you love someone. You know, Pastor Larry, he spoke last week and he talked about another one of those key words that people like to uh, use a lot of these days. And that word is hope, right? For those that were able to hear that message, he, his, his message was just diagnosing and really digging into what real hope looks like. Hope, it cannot be something to this world because the things in this world will wither away. Hope is eternal hope. Hope is in something that can give us more than what we have here. Hope in Jesus Christ gives us something far greater than the hope that this world can offer. But then again, we will say things like, oh, I hope you have a great day. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but I like to try to, some of those really big, impactful words in the, in the Christian language, if that's how you want to say it, I try not to use them in my everyday just for meanings of these things. I like to keep their power, their meaning behind it. We're going to look at those first two. We're going to look at what it means to be born again, and we're going to look at that word love here in the the end of 1 Peter chapter 1. And so if you want to follow along with me and read along, uh, please do so. It'll be up here behind me as well. Seeing ye have purified, verse 22, it says, seeing ye have purified your souls <clears throat> in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all of the flesh is as grass, and all of the glory of men as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower therefore falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. Amen? And this is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. The word of an enduring word. That is the word of truth. And that is the word by which Peter is, is invoking the early church and the bodies and the member thereof to live and, to, uh, and to, to dive into the word of truth, this word of God that will endure forever. I don't want us to devalue the definitions of being born again and love this morning. Let's really look in and see when God is referring to it, what that means in his mind, what that means in his eyes. So today, let's uh, hopefully set aside maybe some of those cliche type of uh, use cases for those words and really dive in. What does it mean to be born again? What does it mean to love your brethren with a pure heart fervently, as Peter just said it? That's where we're going to be diving in this morning. Peter was writing, first of all, to a scattered group who represented the first Christians in a very paganistic world at this point in time. If you go all the way back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, as a reminder, it says that you are the strangers scattered throughout. That's who he's writing to. So Peter, the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, is writing to the strangers scattered throughout. Through God's mercy, they have all been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead in verse 3 of chapter 1. These, this is what is uniting this scattered group of individuals. Okay, The scattered group of believers, they were not made up of, uh, uh, of just a particular group. No, 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 no. 
Remember, the day of Pentecost, when that occurred, many gathered together, different languages, different backgrounds, they all gathered together, and the Holy Spirit revealed the words that were being spoken to the whole group that was there, and thousands were saved, yes? Well, then they all left. They all left the city, and they began to venture back to their homes. So now you have these, these group of, of, of Christians that have been anointed by the Spirit, right? They've all received, they've all been born again, and they're all scattered now back into their areas, where now they go back into what they left would have been a very paganistic viewpoint, where there's a lot of idols and false gods and false teachings, and so now they are trying to navigate this new life that they have now received through Jesus Christ, but li while living in that same old environment. And so Peter is writing to them, trying to encourage them to continue through. It would have been made up of Jews and Gentiles. It would have been made up of a number of groups from all nations gathering and, and, and receiving on the day of Pentecost the Holy Spirit. And you know what they all would have had in common? They all would have been persecuted for their faith. You know, we have that in common today around this world as well. The faith and having the faith in Jesus Christ, claiming to be born again in many aspects will point a big target on your back, right? In fact, Christ even told us, he said, because I have been persecuted, you're going to be persecuted as well. Sin and Satan hate Christ because he is the redeemer. He's the solution, the answer to it, right? And so, of course, they're going to go after those who are trying to bring people from their sins and, and telling them about this truth and about this new birth that can take place in their life, the transformation that can take place in their life. Of course, they're going to be persecuting them. But you know, suffering through these small inner, uh, irritations can sometimes even create larger and trigger larger events to take place. So here you have these, these Jews and these Gentiles, they go back to their own communities. They begin to now share the gospel. They begin to spread the word. And, and, uh, and, and you know, everybody can get along when they're all in the city and the Holy Spirit first comes down on that day of Pentecost and they're all getting along, right? Everybody is singing, they're praising God and everything is great. But then, here's what ends up taking place. Let me, let me know if you've heard this happening in our churches even today. So you have this commonality, right? We are all suffering for Christ. We've all been born again. But, you know, sometimes as you continue to suffer day in and day out, right? You, you become burdened with that suffering. And, and if we don't continue to go back to God and ask God for his assistance and his help in turning over and maintaining that relationship, some of the smallest irritations that in the past or on that day of Pentecost, you know, if somebody actually bumped into you because you're all worshiping, oh, it wouldn't have been a big deal. But now that small little irritation can become like a, dude, get off of me, man. And now it starts bickering even within the body of Christ. Have you ever seen a church bicker before? And what is it over usually? The smallest little thing, a stove. Yeah, most of the time it's just over the smallest little petty fights. It's just over the smallest little things. But you see, when you already are being persecuted, when there's already things that you're dealing with through your face, sometimes those small little irritations can trigger something that really never existed before. That is what was happening to the early church. That is why Peter is now writing this letter and trying to get this word out, encouraging people to stay in their faith, to maintain the hope that they had. To remember what it means to be born again. And through that new birth, as we see here in the last four or five verses of this book or of this chapter, through this new birth, the restored love that it brings between the brothers in Christ. Right? 
loving one another through all of those small little irritations and maintaining this, this holiness of God. We saw last week as Larry uh, went through um, the, 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 the middle section of this chapter, we saw that uh, uh, this call for living a holy lifestyle, one that is, again, filled with hope, holiness, down to the road of life, showing us now, now that we have this definition, what it means to be holy as a core, as a background, now it's leading us, he's leading us into the new birth and the demands that the new birth brings with it. To be born again means, friends, a new love in the family of God. That is going to be. For God so loved the world, right? So he gave his life out of love for you so that you could receive and be born again in your relationship with God the Father, the Creator, right? So he's showing this new birth through love. He's representing it to you. So we are then to take that same rebirth, that same being born again, we are now to share that through love to those around us. This is the kind of the last part of this message that, that Peter is trying to get this early church who are scattered abroad. He's saying, maintain the love, maintain your hope and your holiness, and maintain the love between each other. That's how you're going to be able to continue to weather through. Christians must love because they have been born again through God's imperishable word of truth, is how it starts out. Seeing that you have been purified your souls in obeying the truth. This truth that cannot perish, that will not go away. Again, we saw that Peter stated uh, the, the, the demand in, in verses 15 and 16. Uh, but then he went into this, this lengthy rationale as to why Christians must be holy. Namely, because their Heavenly Father is also their judge, and they have been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. And that's how verse 21 ended, right? Now this similar thought process is here regarding the subject of love. First, he states something that is true of all of his readers due to their conversion. Seeing that you have been purified through obedience. You're purified your souls through obedience, right? So now he, that is him saying, seeing that you've been born again, you've renewed your spirit, you've renewed your soul with God. So now that is the link between you and the person next to you, right? That's the link be that we share between fellow Christians for those who have come and have been born again. They had purified their souls in obedience to the truth for a sincere love of the brethren. In verse 22, part A. Then he states the consequent demand from that, right? So now you've been born again. Something has happened. Now you are being told to fervently love one another from your heart. Be pure of heart, fervently loving one another. So this is kind of how these typical letters were broken up. There would be some sort of statement, and then there would be an exhortation for that. Okay, now that you've been born again, here's kind of the exhortation. Now I encourage you to love one another as Christ loved you. And then it's followed up now with a theological type of aspect, an explanation, uh, the, the reality of the truth here. So now he follows this with this theological truth relative to their conversion. And that's how he goes into, uh, towards the end of verse 24 there, it says, For all the flesh is as grass, and all of the glory of men as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. So this is now this theological uh, explanation for it. He's going back to the book of Isaiah, in chapter 40, verse 4 through 6, and he says, You've been born again, through this imperishable word that even existed, look, way back here, this prophet that many of you knew and have studied about, right? Isaiah spoke of a very similar thing, how it's never going to wither away or die. The things of this world, the grass of this world will wither, but God's word is an imperishable word of truth that can truly transform you 
no matter what stage of life you happen to be in today. That very same word of truth is with us today. Peter is telling us that the kind of holiness that's been described, holiness which stems from the new birth, must work itself out in love for fellow Christians. We're going to look at a couple of aspects of this new birth. Okay, so uh, the teens on Wednesday night, they like to, they, they you know, we, we get through uh, kind of what I refer to as the introduction. So there was your introduction. And now we'll start the sermon, okay? And they all like to say, wow, that was Brian's introduction. Fantastic. I thought that was it. No, 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 no. We're going to go through a couple of points, and of course the points are then going to have some sub-points. See, that's how ministers trick you. They say, oh, I only have a two-point sermon today, but each point then has three. Is that okay? All right. Uh, you know, right before I came up today, uh, I, I had watched, I was downstairs last week, so I watched the live, uh, the live stream version, or I watched the recording online, and and uh, I, I have to admit something here real quick, uh, and then we'll, we'll get back into diving in. But I have to admit something. I'm happy that last week, for those that were here or those that watched it on the live stream, Larry preached for quite a while, didn't he? You know, for, compared to what he had been doing. So downstairs in the children's area, we're always watching the clock, and sometimes he'll have like a 20-minute, 20 25-minute sermon. Last week, he went like 40 or 45. So that now opens the door for me today. That set of precedence, yes, yes, amen. No amens, okay, I got it, I understand. Look, we're going to look first at these two new aspects of the birth, and then we're going to look at what it looks like, this new love that then must follow. And keep in mind, when we are saying a new birth, or when we are claiming what love we are talking about here, this new love, we are talking about a biblical perspective. Okay, I'm not just saying, ooh, I love this new carpet. I'm saying God's love. Okay, I'm saying something that is pure and true and stands the test of time. That's what the kind of love that we are referring to. So the very first thing that we can see is that the new birth is marked by the purity of, soul, of, of the soul in obedience to truth. I'm going to say that again. The new birth is marked by purity of our soul through the obedience, through us being obedient to truth. To understand verse 22, we have to see that Peter is talking about something that takes place at the conversion or the new birth to being born again, right? If this was not so, Peter couldn't state it as he does, that the purity of the soul is the obedience to truth. The very first thing that we do when we uh, become a Christian is what? We're being obedient to the call of Christ. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave a son for whomever, right? But then Paul tells us that all we have to do is be obedient in the confession of our sins. So this very first aspect of becoming a born-again Christian has started out from the new birth, which is being obedient to the call of surrendering to Christ and receiving that gift from him, eternal life. Now, obedience through surrendering and being born again uh, is then symbolized according to Scripture. It's symbolized. Now, let me, let me again stress that. It's outwardly symbolized. Are you with me? Through baptism, that gives us a thought. The old person is being submerged in to the living water of Christ and comes out new, right? But the symbolism of baptism, stepping into the baptism, save the person, right? Just for a second. When Peter talks to his readers about being purified in their souls and obedience to truth, he is now also encouraging them, as Christ did, to be baptized. That is part of it. Again, the baptismal waters are not what save the person. The personal faith in the shed blood of Christ is what offers this new birth. That is what saves the person from God's wrath. In the book of Revelation, when we are all standing there according to the Apostle John and the book of life is open, is it going to say, Yes, this person 
was baptized? Or is it going to say, yes, I know this person. He was covered in my blood. You see, friends, it is that obedience and truth that he starts out being born again, having a purified soul by obeying the truth through the Holy Spirit. But now we are also encouraged as part of this new birth to now step into the pools of baptism, if you will, and as an outward faith or as an outward, uh, um, uh, an outward display of this new birth. But you know, here's the thing that I want us to see. Again, having purified your soul in obeying the truth. If you're using your own Bible, friends, I want you to really emphasize this obedience and truth. Because it now goes farther than just saying, yes, I've received Jesus Christ. I am, I'm not quite sure why, but in our day and age, again, this is just the, the, the world's way, Satan's way of diminishing what it really means to be obedient, right? In our world today, for some reason, there is this belief that if I just believe in Jesus Christ, I am a Christian. Okay, if I truly believe in him, I am a Christian. I've received Christ. Okay, great. But this word of obeying, obeying the truth, being obedient to the truth, now goes much further. This is just step one. Receiving Christ is just the first step, right? We have to continue to be obedient. And for some reason in our world today, we think that just because I've received Christ, I'm now a born-again Christian, but the obedience to him as my Lord, now that's optional. Absolutely not. This is what Peter's trying to tell them. He's like, look, stay the course of being obedient. You followed Christ through the obedience of becoming born again, and by making that statement, by going through that, that process and becoming baptized, you are also saying that I am obedient and I'm going to strive to be obedient to God through this word of truth that he's given us. Now, of course, we have the whole word of truth, right? We have the Bible. Back then, the Bible is being written through these letters, but it's being preached to them all the time. They know what the word of truth really looks like and really is. And for some reason in our world today, we think that the obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord is somehow optional. But it, it, it isn't, friends. Look at the, the verse again in the very first part of 22. Having holiness coming out of verse 21, now you're renewed through this rebirth of obeying the truth. The truth is then what sets you free by adhering to the truth through that message. Somehow or another, we think that we can just go to church at our convenience. It's okay. Uh, you know, if we, we go to church every now and then, you know, like maybe the five core Sundays of the year or something, and, and oh yeah, while well, I'm there, I'll just I'll put a few dollars in the offering plate. I'm good. My relationship with God is good. Friends, that's not being obedient to the truth. <laughs> and loving one another, I have to say that to you today. Because that's not being fully ob obedient to the truth that's before you. Peter said in verse 2 of chapter 1, he said, as a reminder, that we are chosen unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. The word obedience stands alone. It means the acceptance of the gospel and it means the acceptance of the truth. In fact, the opposite of that, when, he, when the scripture is, is, is talking about unbelievers, in, in, even in Peter, in Peter chapter 2, and in Peter chapter 3, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and 3, and, and even down into uh, chapter 4, but in 2 uh, verse 8, we are reminded that he, he re now refers to the unbelievers as those who are being, ready, disobedient to the word. So disobedient to the truth. So again, accepting the truth is the first phase of receiving Christ, but then we have to live the life of continuing to accept God's truth 
And we have to allow that to be an everyday part of our life, picking up our cross on a daily basis and carrying it for Christ, right? In Romans chapter 1, verse 5, Paul describes the goal of his mission on this earth as to bring about the obedience of faith among the Gentiles. He continues in Romans chapter 10, verse 16, he states that not all heed or obey the gospel. But friends, for those who do not heed or obey the truth, they are referred to as those who are not being obedient. Unbelievers. Does this mean that the true Christians never disobey God? We are perfect beings and we follow God's truth all the time? Nothing but the truth? Absolutely not. Of course not. We all fall. We all have sin that we continue to repent from, amen? That we continue to go back and give back unto God. If a person claims to be saved, but lives in chronic disobedience to God and in disregard for God's truth for the word, then that person is deceived. Now hear me on this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, it says, this is now Paul writing, and he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. That's how he says it. And then he goes through the long list that we've all heard probably many times from pulpits around the world. Don't be deceived that those who are fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So in other words, friends, being obedient to the call of becoming born again, receiving Christ as our Savior, is the first part of us being obedient to the word of truth, and then the word of truth continues to guide our life in obedience to that calling. Amen? And he's encouraging us to continue to do that. Don't be deceived. It's not just a believe in one thing and now everything is good. No, it's be obedient to the word of truth. The word of God. Peter's first point is that the new birth is marked by the purity of the soul in obedience. In other words, this new birth is marked by you first being obedient to the call of Christ and receiving him as your savior. Now listen to this. In verse 23 through 25, he now talks about this new birth more. And he says that uh, this new birth comes from, again, so the new birth takes place through God's imperishable word. When you have been born again, it means that you have been purified in your soul. So if you look at verse 23, and it starts out by saying, being born again, this is now paralleling what he said in the first part of 22, when he said, you have been purified in your soul. So to be born again and to be purified in your soul through this obedience, this is all translated in the same way. And essentially it means, since you have now been born again, this is an accomplished fact. So now that you've received Christ as your Savior, now there's this continuous result that needs to take place. And what is this continuous result, this continuous command? So now that you have received Christ as your Savior, now, friends, he is telling us that we need to love one another. There's a command here to love one another. The idea here is that this new birth that took place through God's eternal word has brought us into this new eternal squad or this new eternal family together where God is the Father, amen? He's now linking us together. So he's brought us into this new era, this new family of God where we should be striving to love one another with a pure and fervent heart. We're gonna look at what that looks like now. The new birth takes place through God's imperishable words. <clears throat> Peter's going to bring out and expand upon what this, this, uh, this um, 
this love looks like a little bit. So let's, let's first understand something, that the new birth is effected by God through his word, not by man. Okay, now I don't know about you. I always have struggled, and, and maybe you're in the same boat. What does it mean to be effected or affected, right? It's very close in spelling. How many, have you ever mixed these up? I know I have, so I'm being honest. Here's what it, though, here's what I want you to understand. Effected means it is put in place or it is happening because of the other person or the other thing, right? So what does this mean? Here, let me rephrase this for you. So instead of saying the new birth is effected by God through his word, not by man, this is what it means. It means the new birth is only because of God. Nothing you've done. It only took place because God made it take place. You see what the difference? It's not anything you can do. So even back to that person who says, oh yeah, I can just be, I can be a Christian by coming to church every now and then and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tithe a little bit. Maybe you're the type that's saying, hey, I am here every week. I am a, a loyal churchgoer. Friends, that does not make you a born again Christian. Get that out of the world's view because that's what they want you to think. To be born again is only through God's implication and how he did it was through Jesus Christ. So if you tell me today, yes, I'm born again, and I say, do you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is your savior? Well, he's a great guy. Then you're not born again because that is the word that God put forth to allow you to be born again. The book of John starts out by saying, in the word was God, right? And how was the word? It became flesh. The word is Christ. That is how he effected you to be born again. He put into place through his word, through Jesus Christ, nothing that you can do. God had to have an action in order for you to be born again. That's what that means. It is God who saves us, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of the regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. That's in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. You see, there's nothing that you've done to receive this other than you've been obedient, but God has made the way for you to be obedient. He's given you that, that action to become born again. That is through his word, through the Christ that came. He does it through his word. And, and if you look in, uh, and he continues to affirm this in James chapter 1, verse 18, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. The only way that we can know God, friends, is through his revelation, through the word of God. So now we have this, how do we now continue? Once we become born again, now our, our obedience to the truth, our obedience to the word continues. How does it do that? And it is through the understanding of his word now. He's told us all about all that we need to do to live a Christian life in the word of God. And we just have to pick it up and be obedient to it. That's, that's Peter's goal here. Remember this word of God. Remember that the power that it has to transform lives through just his word. Doesn't even have to be much that we have to do. As I was studying and as I was reading, I came across this story about a gentleman by the name of Gaylord Kambamari. I don't know, I, he's from Zim, uh, Zimbabwe, okay? He's the general secretary of the Biblical Society of, of Zimbabwe. And uh, he was giving this account. He was out and he was sharing the word of God and he was sharing the gospel. He had some New Testaments and you know, he's handing them out to people, and, and uh, he came across this individual, and uh, it, this individual said, um, if you give me that Bible, all I'm going to do is roll up the pages and make it into cigarettes and smoke it. And so Gaylord said, he said, okay, I understand that. You told me that. Do me a favor. Before you roll it up, read the page. That's all I want you to do. Just read the page. Whatever you do with it from there, fine. Read the page. So many years later, uh, 
this, uh, this individual, or, or Gaylord, uh, <clears throat> about 15 years later, Gaylord was attending a convention in Zimbabwe, and the speaker on the platform was up, and he was speaking, and then he just stopped. He stopped speaking, and he pointed out into the crowd to Gaylord. Gaylord was just an attendee there. He wasn't a guest speaker. He was just in attendance. And this person now standing up there speaking in front of this, this, uh, uh, this convention, he said, that man doesn't remember me, but 15 years ago, he tried to sell me a New Testament. And when I refused to buy it, he gave it to me. And though I told him I would use the pages to roll them up as cigarettes, I smoked Matthew, I smoked Mark, I smoked Luke. But when I got to John 3.16, I couldn't smoke anymore. My life was changed and transformed by the word of truth. Think about that just for a minute. God's word, just by hearing it and receiving it, just by hearing God's word, it can transform lives. Amen? You see, Isaiah again tells us that all, and, and, and Peter is, is quoting Isaiah, and it says that all of the flesh is like grass and all of its glory like the flower. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord, that which you are being called to be obedient to, the word of truth, endures forever. There's nothing that can dampen it. Hearing that word can transform your life. This new birth marked by purity of the soul and obedience to the truth, which takes place through God's ear, ear, Im, imperishable word, sorry, is the basis for this command that now Peter says to love one another. The new birth demands a new kind of love. The implication of verse 22 and 23 is that the new love is the necessary result of the new birth. It's not automatic, though. Just because I have received Christ and I've been born again in Christ doesn't mean that I'm automatically going to know what it means to truly love, right? Especially to the love that he is saying here, that we should love one another with a pure and fervent heart. Friends, love is always caring, even when it has to confront even when we have to hold someone accountable, it is, it is devoid of the feelings of compassion and tenderness, but it is of the final result, right? We can't allow sometimes, uh, it, just to love one another doesn't mean that I'm friends with you all the time, meaning, oh, hi, yeah, I hope it's just such a great day. No, sometimes love means embracing one another, right? Sometimes love means to build one another up, to encourage one another. Sometimes love means to confront one another and say what needs to be changed, maybe call each other out, sharpening each other in the word of truth. Love is a powerful thing. But it also requires us it's, it's not us being nice to everyone, but it is requiring us to learn and continue to work at it, to fervently love one another. This word, fervently, stems from a verb meaning to stretch out or to strain. It implies effort and emotion. Don't let love become a stagnant thing in your relationships with one another. Allow it to grow with you. Allow it to be stretched. Because the more you stretch it together, and the more we as a group, the more the body of Christ continues to love one another, we continue to grow in that love together. And we begin to really see and be able to meet each other's needs on a very personal level as well. If you look at that word fervently, we hear that word several times and in one particular case, we know what it is, right? And Jesus, or Jesus used this word. He went into fervent prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke chapter 22. Where he went in and just had an intense prayer dedicated to it. Peter uses this when he's facing prison and facing execution. He was in fervent prayer. 
intense. He had to work at it. It was not something that was just there. Oh, yeah, I'm just praying. No, he was intensely praying. He was intensely doing that. Peter is telling us we have to have an intense love for one another, one that is something that we are working at on a daily basis to strive to get to know each other. Friends, as we've looked at these words and as we look at this enduring word in verse 25, the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Listen to this. Peter is now calling us to be born again and to continue our obedience through that birth, right? In other words, after you receive Christ, you receive the word of truth, now be obedient every day in your life, striving to adhere to the word of truth that will last forever. No matter what mankind tries to do, if they try to uh, take the meanings of the words and, and devalue them in our life and in our society, it doesn't matter. How God intended those words to be used will last forever. Amen? For those who are calling and being called to it to fervently meditate on that and then to then fervently reveal this unto the world through loving the world. Christ was asked by his disciples, God, or Jesus, well, Rabbi, what is the greatest of the commandments? Loving the Lord God, right? Right? Fervently loving God, working at it every day, being obedient to God and to his truth, loving God, that is the first. But the second is really close to it, and it's to love one another. And when we are loving one another, we won't have these things of, uh, you, you know, wanting to steal whatever Mel has. He's got a, a cool little boat. I'd love to have that boat, you know. Hey, you heard it all. Is that recorded? Can you say that louder? I'm just kidding. We won't have this, uh, we won't have the, the lying to one another. Love isn't lying to one another. Love is building up one another, growing together with the common denominator, which is Christ. Are you working at love as you should be? Are you working at being an obedient follower of Christ, as you should be? Those are the questions that I would pose to you today. For those who have said this morning, yes, I have been born again, are you being obedient, even today, to the word of truth that's being presented? And if you can't answer that as a yes, then I would go back and now ask the simple question of, have you truly been obedient to Christ? in his surrendering of your sins in that new birth? Are you a born-again Christian? And can you back that up by saying, I'm striving to be obedient to God's word? I'm not the casual Christian. I'm dying daily to myself so that I can see Christ grow. That's the kind of love and that's the kind of birth that he's asking for today, obedience in him. Am I loving those around me? Not the kind of love where I love McDonald's, I love steak, but the kind of love that Christ revealed, the kind of love that says, I am willing to sac be sacrificed for you, right? I, I, he's, I'm willing to surrender myself for your eternal life. A kind of love that will look beyond maybe faults and failures, It'll embrace, it'll restore. It won't cast down a judgment, but it will hold accountable. It's not being nice necessarily, not just all, hey, roses, everything is perfect. We don't live in a perfect world. We are not perfect people. Sometimes in ministry we say, you know, as pastors, people are messy, right? Right? And it's trying to navigate that messiness with love that can keep the ministries going, embracing one another as Christ has embraced us today. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this time together, and I just pray for an anointing of your spirit to take us 
And Lord, this morning as we just surrender our lives unto you, I pray for those that are in this place, uh, that Lord, if they have received you as their Savior, that they'd be willing to say and claim that yes, I am an obedient, uh, born-again Christian. And Father, I pray that if there are those in this room today that maybe cannot make that statement and that are still just, uh, uh, just barely impacting in that belief or that, that walk of being born again, that, Lord, you would just reveal to them that your spirit would lead them to the truth. Father, allow us to not be deceived today, but allow us to see your word and your truthfulness through the love that was displayed for us that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. God, it is only through you that we can have the restoration. It is only through the blood of Christ that we can be saved today. Anoint us, God. And it's in the name of Jesus your people gather and pray today. Why don't you stand with us this morning? You know, Pastor Brian was just talking a lot about obedience and um, this closing song that we have to do, have to sing with you today is about stepping out on the waves and a lot of times that's, that's uh, attributed to faith and having that trust and faith. But also there's obedience in that, right? Listening and, and knowing what God has called you to do. And sometimes the call is very simple. It's that's simply right. to love, that's to right. love, love deeply and to risk. Um, when you don't want to risk sometimes you want to protect yourself so as we sing this song together I uh, my prayer is that we would tap into that deeper meaning um, not just about the trusting and faith but that maybe what God is calling you to do what is he calling you to be obedient to today You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, an ocean steep, my faith will stand. And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you are mine Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you never fail and you won't start now. And I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are the 
God is an awesome God, and we thank you for coming and joining us this week, and we're going to close in a word of prayer. Uh, just before I do that this morning, just real brief, uh, next week, uh, super excited. So, uh, you know, we have River of Life Kenya, right, way across the big blue there, and uh, they are just doing some amazing things. Uh, we actually just got a whole new slew of pictures of their new worship space. Remember, they bought some property, they built a building. Uh, guys, it is absolutely fantastic. They have people that have been taking like an hour and a half bus ride just one way every week. And, and they've been going through uh, ministry uh, sessions with Pastor Evans over there. And uh, to a point where they are actually beginning to church plant back in their own area. So about an hour and a half away from the main River of Life Kenya campus, they are now beginning to do a small church plant uh, over in there. So just continue to pray for them. God is doing some awesome things, and, and we are part of that. We're part of that because we're part of God's family, because we are affiliated with them and, and supporting them in those efforts. So uh, next week, out on the Welcome Center uh, um, uh, display out there, there's actually, I'm just going to put up a, a rolling slideshow of all of the different pictures that we've been getting in. Uh, so just continue to pray for Kenya. Uh, as the, they continue to grow and, and through our support as well. So we thank God for that, and we know that he is an awesome and mighty God. No matter where we are, we just have to be obedient to, to his call today of stepping out and allowing him to do his, his work in our life. So as you leave from here, be obedient to that call. Trust in him. The truth of God can set you free today. We just have to let it. We just have to allow it. Let's pray. God, it is so good to be in your house to worship today. I just ask and pray for your anointing spirit as we go from this place. We are now re-entering the mission field, Lord, where we will continue to be your hands and your feet. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we are sending out today. And it's in his Holy Spirit's power uh, that we can see lives changed and restored and transformed today. And it's in your name we pray. Mm -hmm.